Hi, everyone. For the next couple of sessions that we cover, things like the celestial sphere, uh, the seasons, eclipses, moon phases, things like that, there are going to be a couple of resources that I'm going to be using that are online. Things like the interactive sky chart, some constellation views of the sky, applications to demonstrate how the phases of the moon are changing, eclipses. I'm going to be using a couple of these to help visualize some of these topics. I do recommend that students have a look at some of these because they can really help give you a bit more of a 3D understanding, a geometric understanding of some of the topics that we're going to be talking about. But for this session, we're going to be looking at the celestial sphere. And this celestial sphere is a model that we can use to describe how the apparent position of stars and other objects in the sky change over the course of a night and over the course of a year. We know that there is not actually a giant celestial sphere up there. This is simply a model that helps us again, predict where different uh, stars in the sky are going to be at what times of day or night. This is ultimately caused by the earth orbiting around the sun and all of the other stars being very, very, very far away. And since stars are so far away, we don't really have good depth perception of the stars. So even if I see two little dots of light that seem to be you know, right beside each other, it's really hard, basically impossible with our own eyes. Uh, you need very specialized telescopes under very special conditions to actually determine that depth perception. So even though stars are gonna be spread out throughout space, in one region of the sky, they basically just look like points of light. So we're going to model that as all of these stars being on this giant celestial sphere. But again, this is not a real physical thing. It's just a helpful tool for deciding, for determining how our view of the sky changes over the course of a night. So a couple of uh, terminology points about this. Let's say that this is the Earth, and we're going to say that this is the Northern Hemisphere, and this is the Southern Hemisphere. Let me reset my camera just to make sure it's as clear as possible. And the Earth rotates on its axis. We're going to imagine this celestial sphere to be this giant ball on which all of the stars are resting. There would be this region called the celestial equator, which is basically all the points on this celestial sphere that are directly over top of some point on Earth's equator. If this is Earth's equator and the Earth is rotating on its axis like this, this equator of the Earth will always be directly underneath the celestial equator. We also have the North and South celestial poles. If this is the Earth rotating on its axis, and again, all the stars are on this modeled celestial sphere, there's gonna be a point directly over top of the North Pole where as you, even as the Earth rotates, the North Pole, if you look straight up from the North Pole, you'll always see that North Celestial Pole. If you were on the Southern Hemisphere, if you were at the South Pole and you looked straight up from your location, remember you'd be kind of standing like this on the South Pole, if you looked straight above your head, well, that would be where the South Celestial Pole is located. This celestial sphere is broken up into regions that we call constellations. Okay. A constellation is a region of the sky, not some set of stars. We identify, we often identify the constellation by what the brightest set of stars in that constellation look like, but officially a constellation is a region of the sky. And the sky is broken up into 88 of these constellations. Essentially, this gives astronomers a shorthand way to give information about the general region of the sky that some object is located in. So if I say, oh, look at the constellation Orion, I will know approximately where on the sky to look. If I want to look at the, say, oh, there's something, there's some object in the constellation Cassiopeia, 
Well, I know approximately where in the sky I should be looking. And again, these 88 constellations cover the entire celestial sphere. So these stars, even though the stars are spread throughout space, due to our lack of depth perception, we're just going to be modeling them as being all on this celestial sphere, even though, again, we know in reality, they're all at different distances. And there's a location, there's a region of this celestial sphere, a loop around this celestial sphere that we call the ecliptic. And this ecliptic is the sun's apparent path across the celestial sphere. Now, again, I want to be very clear about this. This is a model to help us identify what stars we're going to see on different times of night and different days of the year. We know that it's not the sun going around the Earth. The Earth goes around the sun, and all of these stars are much, much further away. So let's try to model this a little bit so we have a bit better idea of how this celestial sphere and how the actual reality of how these objects are located in space, how those mesh up with each other. So let's say we've got the sun, the sun at the middle of our solar system, and we've got the earth, and the earth is orbiting around the sun. And much, much further away from either of these two objects, we have the stars in the sky. So again, these should be much, much further away. This is definitely not to scale, but we've got a bunch of stars across the sky. The Earth is going through some very specific motions in the solar system. It's rotating on its axis. So Earth rotates Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours. It takes Earth one day to do a full to do a full rotation on that axis. So let's see how that would affect what stars we're going to be able to see. So let's say I'm going to start with putting a person on this Earth. Let's say I'm going to put them right here. Let's say they're standing on the Earth. This is definitely not to scale. And from their position on the Earth, the sun would be high overhead in the sky. So approximately what time of day or night would this be if the sun is at its highest location in the sky? As always with these sessions, I encourage you to pause, think about the question, try to come up with an answer, and then compare it with what I'm going to say in just a couple of seconds. So if the sun was, if I was on this location on the Earth and the sun was high overhead, approximately what time of day would it be? Now, that would be around 12 noon. So this would be approximately noon for that observer on the Earth. The sun would be high overhead. But Earth is, again, rotating on its axis. And the way that the Earth rotates, if we were to look at the Earth from above the North Pole, this rotation would be counterclockwise. So counterclockwise, when viewed, above North Pole. So Earth's going through this rotation. Well, let's say I waited a little bit of time. I'm going to erase this so I can draw on this portion. Erase that a little bit. Let's say I waited as the Earth rotates, and I'm standing on this rotating Earth, so I'm going to rotate with it. So let's say I waited until I was at this location on the Earth. Let me reset the camera. I've gone through a quarter of rotation from 
the position that I was at at noon to this new position. So approximately what time of day or night would this correspond with if I've gone through a quarter of a rotation of the Earth from the noontime position? Yeah. Quarter of a rotation, a quarter of 24 hours is about six hours. So at this point in time, it would be about 6 p.m. And we might want to know, well, what stars would I be able to see at 6 p.m.? Or what region of the celestial sphere would I be able to see at 6 p.m.? Well, we can try to draw our view of the sky. This would be my horizon. This would be the limit of what I can see on this position on the Earth. So notice that the sun would be just about to go below my horizon. The sun right now would be approximately setting in the west. This model, we are just kind of dealing with a two-dimensional model. It's not us on a 3D Earth. The math gets a fair bit more complicated for a 3D Earth. We're just going to take this as kind of a first introductory model to get the general idea. So as, as the Earth is rotating, as the Earth is rotating, my view of the sky, everything that I can see is going to be changing. At noon, I would be able to see everything on the bottom part of this diagram. Now it's 6 p.m. I would see the sun setting in the west, and I would be able to see a different set of stars far over here. So we can see a certain set of stars. So any stars in any of these locations, I would be able to see. But the Earth would be continuing to rotate. So if we waited a little while more, let me see if I can quickly get rid of some of this stuff again. Let's say I waited another six hours. After another six hours, I would have gone through a quarter rotation on the Earth, and now it would be around 12 midnight. And my view of the sky would have, again, changed. This would be my horizon, and I'd be able to see all the stars above my horizon. My view of the sky has changed over the course of these this six-hour period. And if we waited another six hours, this person, let's wait another six hours. I would have gone through another quarter rotation. My horizon would be in this direction. I'd be able to see all the stars above the horizon. And this would correspond with 6 a.m. And around 6 a.m., that's when I would see the sun starting to rise in the eastern half of the sky. So this is intended to kind of show how our view of the sky changes over the course of a single night. Because the Earth is rotating, this set of stars that's very, very far away from our solar system, this set of stars, we're going to see different regions of the sky at different times of day or night. So that's how our view of the sky changes owing to Earth's rotation on its axis. But what about if we change what day of the year it is, what time of year it is? When the person started over here at local noon for that person, from their perspective, the sun would appear to be in front of some region of the celestial sphere. Some set of stars over here, the sun would appear to be in front of those stars. But what would happen if we waited for a bit of time? So Earth is rotating, is uh, revolving around the sun. So let's write that down as our next motion. So Earth... orbits the sun in 12 months. It takes one year for the Earth to go all the way around the sun. 
And again, when viewed from above the North Pole, this rotation is still going to be counterclockwise. Again, all the diagrams that I draw of this are going to be looking down on the North Pole. So all these rotations and revolutions and things like that, all those motions for our solar system are going to be counterclockwise. So if it takes 12 months for the Earth to go all the way around the sun, how long would it take the Earth to move to this location in its orbit around the sun? Well, that would be a quarter of an orbit, or a quarter of the way around the sun. So that would be a quarter of a year, around three months. And now let's say, well, at noon, at local noon, when the sun is high overhead, what set of stars would the sun appear to be in front of? Well, at that time of year, because our viewing platform, because the Earth is at a different location in its orbit, the sun will now appear to be in front of a different set of stars. This ecliptic, that is simply the path around the celestial sphere that the sun appears to take. It's not that the sun is orbiting around the earth, it's that our view of the sun in front of these background stars changes as the Earth orbits around the Sun. So that's what we're talking about with this ecliptic. Sometimes it's helpful to think of the entire celestial sphere being tilted so that as the Earth orbits around the Sun, this ecliptic is set up to be horizontal. And all of the rest of the planets are orbiting in pretty much the same plane of the solar system. So most of the planets, you'll find them on or near the ecliptic as well. So for stargazers who are trying to find locations of planets on the night sky, looking along that ecliptic is a good way to try to find them. If we go back to this, uh, this picture of the Earth orbiting the sun, if I waited another three months, if I waited another three months and the Earth is now at this location, well, now the Sun is going to be in front of a different set of stars. And the stars over here are now going to be visible when they were not visible six months earlier. Six months earlier, when I was at this location, the Sun was basically blocking my view of these stars. Whenever these stars were above my horizon, the sun is also above the horizon. But six months later, now, if it's local midnight for me, so I'm on a location on the Earth that's pointing away from the sun, now I'm going to be able to see those stars high overhead. So the two kind of motions that we want to be careful, that we want to try to understand, and I recommend trying to reproduce these diagrams yourself, we want to know how our view of the sky changes over different times of day, basically as we sit on this rotating earth, our direction that we're pointing in is going to be changing. So we're gonna see different stars in the sky and how different days of the year, depending on where we are in our orbit around the sun, the sun will be in front of different sets of stars and we might be able to see sets of stars that we don't always see at all different times of the year. This diagram is trying to, again, visualize the same sort of thing that I was identifying over here. As the Earth orbits around the Sun, the Sun will appear to be in front of different constellations. And which constellations are visible at midnight, you know, when you're on the side of the Earth that's pointed away from the Sun, the constellations that are visible at midnight are going to be different at different times of the year. So let's do a little bit more terminology with this. At any point of the Earth, we can only see a part of the sky. This is what we call the local sky. I might have been using that terminology a little bit earlier. My apologies if I was using terminology before properly defining it. 
So let's say I'm standing on the Earth at this location. This is, again, not to scale. My local horizon would be everything that's above the horizon of the Earth. The Earth is basically blocking my view of all of the celestial sphere that's below my horizon. But I would be able to see everything above that celestial sphere. Again, we call this our local sky. And again, this local horizon and local sky depends on where you are on the Earth. If I was on the equator, let me try this. If I was standing on the equator, then my local horizon would look something like this. And my local sky would be this part of the sky. Also, as the Earth is rotating, if I'm standing on this side of the Earth and can see this part of the celestial sphere, as the Earth rotates on its axis, well, now I'm going to be able to see some other part of the celestial sphere, some other set of stars. If we take that view, so take the previous view that we were looking at, and just kind of tilt it to be more from our perspective. Again, there's a couple of pieces of information that we can extract from this. Our zenith is defined as any points that are directly overhead. And again, as we're on this rotating Earth, our zenith, the point that's directly overhead, is going to be looking at different parts of the celestial sphere. Let's look at a couple of the properties of how our sky depends on where we're located on this rotating Earth. Let's say we're observing from Chillicothe, Ohio, which is at a latitude of approximately 39 degrees north. Well, there's a couple of interesting properties where it turns out that there's a relatively bright star called Polaris that's located very, very close to the North Celestial Pole. It's within about one degree. So even as we sit on this rotating Earth, that North Star is going to be at the same angle, basically the same location on the sky, the same angle above the horizon to the North. And this stays true no matter how the Earth rotates. And it turns out that the angle of the North Star above the direction that's just due North will be equal to your latitude. So let me say that again. The altitude of the North Celestial Pole above the direction that just is due north for you will always equal your latitude whenever you're in the Northern Hemisphere. I want to try to demonstrate this a little bit. Let me go to this description. Okay, so I'm going to run this. This is trying to simulate. Let me get this uh, full screen view. This is trying to simulate how our view of the celestial sphere changes as the Earth is rotating. Okay. Over here, we have the North Celestial Pole. It'll change color depending on whether it would be local daytime or local nighttime, but we're looking at the, uh, the constellations. This would be the North Celestial Pole. And you'll notice that as the Earth rotates underneath this celestial sphere, Polaris never gets very far away from the North Celestial Pole. It's always at the same location. And that location, the height above the North Pole, because we've got North down here, its angle above the North Pole is always going to be equal to our latitude. If I, say, went to the equator, or very near the equator, and that North Celestial Pole is just barely over top, just barely above the horizon Looking when looking to the north. If I was in, at some very, very northern latitude, so I move this up and I'm almost basically at the North Pole, then that star Polaris is going to be very, very high above our head. It's almost going to be 90 degrees above our head. In fact, if you were exactly at the North Pole, 
the North Star would be almost directly above you in that case. So basically, the closer you are to the equator, the closer Polaris is going to be to the northern horizon. If you're right at the equator, Polaris is going to be right at your northern horizon. As you move further and further north, your view of Polaris is going to be higher and higher in the sky. Okay, let me switch that back. So, hopefully everyone has GPS and no one gets this lost where you don't know your latitude. But you can actually go out and test this and say, well, if this is my local latitude, then that should be the same as the angle of the North Star above the horizon. And you can you know, go out and verify that. Let me do one other view, actually. Let me go to this uh, Sky and Telescope website. So this is looking at basically your view if you were facing north, facing east, facing south, facing west. Um, and the North Star is this one right here. If I start moving time ahead in one hour increments, Notice that the North Star stays pretty much in the same place, and all of the other stars seem to be rotating around it. If I keep on going forward one hour, and you kind of fix your view right near this North Star, you'll see that everything seems to be rotating counterclockwise. All of the stars seem to be rotating counterclockwise around the North Star. This is another property of Earth's motion on its axis and how that affects our view of the celestial sphere. So we've got a couple of cases here. Again, Earth's axis always points at the North Celestial Pole. Okay. So as Earth rotates, there are some stars that are going to seem to rise in the eastern half of the sky and set in the western half of the sky. And basically, I can't really draw the Earth rotating, so I'm going to draw the perspective of the star changing. Basically, the star rises in the eastern half of the sky, cuts across the sky, sets in the western half of the sky. So some stars are going to do that. On the other hand, stars that are closer to the North Celestial Pole will never seem to rise or set, depending on our latitude. These are called circumpolar stars. So these stars will appear to just keep on going around that North Celestial Pole. Basically, it's our latitude that determines what our sky is going to look at on look like on a given night. Your longitude, how far east or west you are, doesn't really matter because if I'm at a certain location, if I'm at a certain location on the Earth and there's another location on the Earth that's equal latitude, but different longitude. Well, in a very short amount of time, the Earth is just going to rotate me into that same position that the other observer was at. So our longitude doesn't really affect what our view of the night sky is going to be uh, very much, basically just delaying it by a couple of hours. It's more the latitude that affects our view of the sky. Let's kind of simulate that with these two simulations again. So again, if I change the latitude, that's going to change which stars I can see, which stars I can't see, which stars are going to be rising and setting, which stars never rise or set. And let me aim it at a mid-latitude. Notice, if we look at some of the stars close to the North Celestial Pole, close to Polaris, these ones are never going to rise or set. They're just going to keep on going on these circles around the North Star. Other stars are going to rise and set. Notice there are some stars over here that are, you know, some stars there that are rising in the eastern half of the sky, cut across the sky, and eventually set somewhere in the western half of the sky. So these would be the circumpolar stars, the ones that never rise or set. These are the ones that are rising in the, again, eastern half of the sky, setting in the western half of the sky. You might also notice 
that there are some stars, if we're at a northern latitude, there are some stars far to the south that we are never going to be able to see from our latitude. So if I go back to the slides, even as this person rotates around on this rotating Earth, from these northern latitudes, there are going to be some stars near the south celestial pole that they are never going to be able to see. This is one of the reasons why we want observatories across the Earth, both in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere, to be able to monitor and study all different parts of the sky. So let's look at a couple of cases of this. These are time-lapse images, basically setting up a camera on a tripod and taking a picture with a very long exposure, basically turning the camera on and just leaving it on so it's continually letting light in. And if you do that, and you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you'll find that stars appear to move counterclockwise around this North Celestial Pole as viewed from the Earth. Okay. So this is an image from uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii at a latitude of 19 degrees north. And the North Celestial Pole is about 19 degrees of an angle above that northern horizon. On the other hand, stars in the southern hemisphere will move clockwise around the south celestial pole, again, as observed from Earth. Unfortunately, there are no especially bright stars very close to the south celestial pole. We're kind of lucky with uh, Polaris being very, being relatively bright and very close to the North Celestial Pole. Southern Hemisphere doesn't have that. But this is an image from the Gemini Observatory in Chile at a latitude of around 30 degrees south. This is one of the kinds of motion that a flat Earth model does not explain. If you have this flat Earth model, you can't really use that model to explain why the stars appear to move counterclockwise around the North Celestial Pole and clockwise around the South Celestial Pole. The rotating Earth explains this pretty easily. If you look above you, look directly above you, and start going in a circle to your right, if you fix your eyes on a point directly above you, all of the other things will appear to go counterclockwise around that one point that's directly above you. If there's like a light fixture that you can kind of stand directly under, that can help identify this particular motion. So when I look up and I'm rotating again to my right, as I look up, I see everything going counterclockwise around that point that's directly above my head. If I keep rotating in exactly the same direction and look straight down, if there was a fixed point on the floor that I would look at, then everything else would appear from my perspective to be going clockwise around that point that would be directly below me. A spherical or oblate spheroid Earth rotating on its axis, it explains these two motions very, very easily. Flat Earth models can't really do this. So let's try these just as some thought experiment questions. Suppose I looked straight up and saw motions of the stars like this. Where might I be located? Or what possible locations could I be sitting at if I looked straight up and saw these star motions? So pause the video for a second and kind of think through that one. Well, basically, if I'm in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, all these stars go directly around the North and South Celestial Poles, respectively. So if the North Celestial Pole is directly overhead, that means I must be at the North Pole. Let's actually try to simulate this. So for this sky and telescope interactive sky chart, you can enter a latitude. Let's go right to 90 degrees. Then this point would be directly above my head. And as I go forward, let me go forward in hour increments. 
doesn't seem to be updating. Hmm, that doesn't seem to be updating right now. Let's try the other one. Maybe the other one will work better. If I was directly on the North Pole, all of the stars would be rotating around this point directly above my head. Same with the South Celestial Pole. If we were right in the South, all these points would be rotating the opposite direction above my head if I was sitting at the South Pole, the South Celestial Pole. One other question. These images, again, are made by taking a very long exposure, basically just leaving the camera on and letting light continually enter the camera and the stars trace out these different paths. Think about this. Can you estimate how long did it take to record this image? How long was the camera running for? Is there any aspect of this that you can use to identify approximately how long was this uh, exposure for the camera. So pause it for a second and have a think about that. Well, think about this. How long would it take one of those stars that's making these circles around the North Celestial Pole, how long would it take that to do a full circle? Full circle would take 24 hours, the amount of time it takes the Earth to rotate on its axis. Well, this image, the star trails, they don't seem to go all the way around. It seems to go about a third of the way around, you know, a little over a quarter, not definitely not a half, but a little over a quarter of a rotation. So if it's making about a third of a circle, that means we're waiting for about a third of Earth's rotation time. A third of 24 hours is around eight hours. So this image probably took about eight hours to, uh, to generate this image. So again, this would be the north and south uh, poles where you'd be if you saw this looking directly overhead. Uh, what about this one? If you took one of these long exposure star images and got something like this, approximately where would you be located? So again, in this case, whichever pole this is, I think this one is the South Celestial Pole, um, but this is right near the horizon. Where on the Earth would you have to be if the North and South Celestial Poles were right on your horizon? Well, if we go back to this one, if the Earth is tilted like this, now the South Celestial Pole is right looking due south, the North Celestial Pole is right on the horizon looking due north, and all the stars are going up and over those poles. So at these locations, at this location, this would be located very close to the horizon, or sorry, very close to the equator. So the North or South Celestial Pole is right at that uh, horizon. This last one, well, this would be at some mid-northern latitude. Again, we see some stars that are circumpolar and are just kind of rotating around and will never rise or set. Other stars that would be setting in the western half of the sky, rising in the eastern half of the sky, which isn't included in this image. Uh, but this would be at some kind of mid-northern latitude. So we'll call that good for talking about the celestial sphere. And we'll switch over to the next part talking about seasons in the next video.